and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Alyssa Lynn from The Standard. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. And this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there, and to talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today we are joined by Alyssa Leon, the fraud data scientist at the Standard. And normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Alyssa, hello and welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so glad uh, to have you on this podcast. Um, I've had an opportunity to meet and chat with you a little bit before this, and we just had so much fun. So I really look forward to uh, sharing with the community the cool things that uh, you have done. Great. Um, so tell me, okay, so you're the fraud data scientist at the standard. So tell me what type of business is the standard? Absolutely. So we're an insurance and financial institution and the product lines that I typically work on are like disability claims. So long-term disability, short-term disability, supplemental life insurance, and also retirement plan accounts and individual annuities. Hmm, interesting. And as a fraud data scientist, what do you do? Yeah, great question. So uh, it's kind of a funny title, fraud data scientist, when we're looking for anti-fraud and we're hoping to shoot for fraud and risk tools. So what I build is AI and machine learning tools that help better identify and negate our risk for fraud in the industry. Oh, that's that's very, very cool. Um, And how do you work with data in your job? That's a really good question. You know, we're an old company. We were started in the early 1900s. And so some of our systems are also pretty old. (laughs) Um, One of our mainframe systems is from the 70s. And so one of the things that keeps things interesting is how to communicate all these disparate systems together. And so although we're a long way from where we were several years ago and, you know, even further before that, it's still not perfect. And so um, some data scientists, especially in startups, they have really clean, pretty data and they can just build models off of that. I would say a good chunk of our job is cleaning the data. I think somebody said when I first started that a data scientist's job is 90%, you know, getting the data ready and then 10% doing the cool modeling stuff. That's hundred percent how it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is very much my experience. And I think it is both good and bad. I think having this core SME and the systems expertise um, is really important. I will talk about it, I'm sure shortly, but I started in the claims area, specifically in the special investigations unit. So having some of that knowledge on how we work and how our business works um, was really important to building a lot of these tools as opposed to coming in from a tech perspective and being the expert and then having to learn the systems knowledge. We found the most successful candidates are ones that actually know our business really, really well. Now, I know um, we've talked about a little bit uh, in in the past, you know, you talked about some really cool things that you're doing for to eliminate bias in in your in your tools tell me a little bit more about that yeah no that's a great question so especially being the fraud and risk person i think one of the things that we're most concerned about is bias so uh as you know with model biases over time there can be inherent bias whether that be because of derived characteristics that we have so let's say you know, like profiling characteristics, maybe gender, race, voice, um, or also there can be, let's say you don't have any of those characteristics, which happens often. Well, there's still ways to form bias, right? You can use zip code, you can use area of where they live, you can use background, like heritage information. So that's bad. And so one of the things that we need to do, and we we are doing and maintaining that is using tools like BizG or um, some in-house algorithms to check that. And also we wanna track drift over time to make sure our models aren't making conclusions that shouldn't be, especially um, given that, let's say it's not even about a protected characteristic that we're concerned about, but even just making leaps and assumptions about trends over time could be problematic. So monitoring the models for any sort of that uh, disparaging drift is huge in what we do. 
Very cool. Okay, so let's back it up a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about how you got to where you are. So tell me, Alyssa, you know, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? Say you were six years old. Did you say, I'm going to grow up and be a fraud data scientist? Or no, what was I didn't even know. That was. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I also didn't know about, say, disability products when I came into this. I uh, was lucky to have landed this job a couple months before I graduated and they held the job for me. But I will say when I started, I was in the special investigations unit. I have um, degrees in criminal justice and computer science. So I was just happy to get a job in either. And so I did uh, land one in criminal justice and had no tech skills needed. And so um, I think the way the path is actually kind of fun how we got here. But no, uh, as as a little kid, I absolutely would have not been able to well, name what this, was but the I'm dream? so glad I'm here. Uh, the dream was pathologist, actually, but then I hate oh. chemistry. <laughs> wow. How did you, why, why pathologist? Oh, I just love the diseases. I think they're so interesting. I I personally have MS, and so I'm in the hospital systems a lot. And um, I God, I've always loved diseases. I was diagnosed when I was 16. So that, among other things, um, just found all of that very interesting. Oh, well, thank you for sharing the, that vulnerable fact and, and fascinating. Okay, so so you're, you you want to be a, a pathologist. You discover you chemistry is not your jam. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so so where do you go? So you decide, so you mentioned, so you, you're going into college. What are you studying? Yeah, absolutely. So I went in thinking I was going to be a chem major and I ultimately switched. I actually had a really insightful conversation with a history professor of all people, um, one of my passions has always been cryptography, and mm -hmm. I know that that's much harder to get a job in. And so, especially at my the point in time, um, cryptography to me was mostly making up ciphers and languages. And I have you know all these journals that are all these different versions of those. And so he's just like, you know, computer science and coding has a lot of similarities and overlap. And so I took a couple courses and I adored it. Um, and then I've also really been into criminal profiling and criminology. So it just landed that way. Wow. So you majored in both. Yeah. That's amazing. And then my master's yeah. degree is in psych. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. I love that. Wow. What a combination at that. And I'm sure the psych helps in uh, a lot in a lot of what you do even today. Absolutely. And I think one of the things, you know, that we're hoping to build in the future is a comorbidity predictive model. So one of the things we found is claims for disability that have a, a tagged on a behavioral health comorbidity that happens during the period of disability in the first three to five months. They actually have a much longer tail because they develop this mental health disorder that's, you know, really impacting their uh, ability and resilience to want to go back to work. And so if we can better give them the tools and identify who these individuals are up front, that can be really game changing for their experience. I think one of the things that I like about this company so much is both how employee faced and focused they are and customer focused they are and trying to find the best way to get this person back to their best selves is what we're really hoping to do here. And yes, using the psych degree is what I hope to use for that. But also from a profiling perspective, I would say we're doing some cool, cool, cool tools when it comes to account takeover and re, uh, retirement plans. One of the examples I think you and I talked about it last week was, you know, for the sake of bias, we were asked to build a, a NLP model, natural language processing on the phone center calls, because let's say we have a participant call in and they're trying to make a distribution. Well, what happens when it's a fraudster. So we typically have some previous recordings saved of that person's voice. So right now the process is an investigator listens to that, but the things they're listening for, right? Are, is it the same gender? Is it the same uh, accent? Is it the same tone of voice, right? Well, those are mostly protected characteristics. So of course we can't model for that. So um, my coworker and I had to get creative. And what we ultimately are trying right now uh, from an experimentation standpoint is using a convolutional neural network path uh, technique called diffusion. So basically Basically, um, it can be done for audio or visual. And uh, when I think about it from a visual standpoint, think of like a picture of a cat. And then the next layer, um, you move some of those pixels around. So it's like a cat with some rainbow dots and then more and more rainbow dots as it goes down the line till finally it's just like TV static. So then the model is trained to rebuild that picture of the cat by going line by line. And you can base um, how big the grid is as it goes down. And then it ultimately re uh, produces a picture of a kind of blurry cat. So that's what we're doing, but from an audio perspective. So we're trying to rebuild based off the training data, which is the previous claimants uh, or participants' phone voices, 
a, a new snapshot. And then that snapshot will be compared to the new one that we're concerned about uh, being a fraudster. And then it'll be flagged from there for an analyst to review. But that way it'll cut out a lot of the time that these investigators have to listen sometimes for hours about previous calls just to make sure it's not the same voice and it's super cool to do something like this just to you know avoid bias because there's an easier way to do it but it's not an ethical way to do it oh i love that you're building so many ethics into your platform um and so and let's okay so let's continue the journey then so you you you've got all these degrees now um so what's your first job out of college Absolutely. So uh, right after my bachelor's, literally the day after I graduated, I started at the Standard and as a research assistant, assistant technically it was a temp job, um, mm -hmm. temp to hire at the Standard. And uh, that's one of my favorite bosses ever. He was so great in that when I showed uh, interest in different areas, like beyond just the investigatory work, he helped um, tell me where to go and like who to talk to. And I think that that's something that I've always really loved about this company is when they see you have interest or passion about something else, let's, you know, utilize that. Let's build that. Um, so I, it was a great job. It was really cool. We were looking up participants and uh, claimants to make sure that they were telling us the truth about a lot of their uh, disabilities or, you know, life insurance policies, et cetera. So um, some of the stuff I did, what was cool was there was time for exploration. And we did not have a business intelligence department at the time. Um, I was one of the first people in that department. And so as we were kind of ramping that up, um, and that was around 2018, I, in the meantime, I started conversing with some of those folks because it's cute to call it a model now, but it was kind of like a needle in the haystack. You know, we have so many thousands of claims. How do we figure out which ones to best investigate without any tips or uh, any leads? And so um, again, it's cute to call it a model now. It was very rules-based, but it, but we've actually expanded on that and we've made a really cool ML model um, that we use now that is actually what I was intending to build in the first place. But just having that opportunity to say, sure, go for it. Um, and build with the resources I had at the time. Um, additionally, one of the cool things was I became friends with, uh, she was an intern at the time, but she ultimately became, I think our very first data scientist. Um, she and I built a web scraping tool because not only are we trying to build tools for the sake of like, you know, how can you score things better? How can you find the things that you're looking for? But also automation, right? So um, ultimately it wasn't used and I for ethical reasons, but it was really cool to build this scraper in Python uh, using the Selenium packaging from scratch as also just like with zero experience before that. I think it was cool for both of us, you know, young guns just figuring out online, how do you build something like this? Um, and it was super cool. And yeah, it ultimately didn't get used, but just knowing that we could build it was probably the best part. And of course that got people's attention, even if we didn't ultimately take it on again, for ethical reasons, it had nothing to do with the quality. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No. And again, I love that, that you as a company, like have all these, these standards for no pun intended uh, <laughs> for ethics and, and such. Um, so, so you've been, you've been at the standard for most of your career. Almost nine years now, which feels crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, I really like that. It speaks highly about their, their environment, um, as you've Absolutely. mentioned. So tell me then, um, what's been your biggest lesson so far in your career? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess really quickly to piggyback a little bit. So I moved from special investigations unit to being one of the first BI members. I was a, a business intelligence uh, analyst for, I think, a year and a half. And then I became an analytics consultant before. And I was on the data science team at that point. Um, we were a little more specific about certain degrees to have to become the full data scientist at the time. But now um, it doesn't have to be like a PhD in stats anymore, which is really nice because I think that that holistically gets us more contenders, especially because some of our best players right now are just getting like they just finished their bachelor's, but explicitly in AI and data science. And boy, are they brilliant. I think that getting rid of that restriction has really just expanded of the team's potential but um sorry what was your question oh hey, that's fine no good I'm sorry that I skipped over that no no that's on me <laughs> <laughs> no I, I really like that um uh, so then what's been your biggest lesson so far in your career thank you so much um it 
a couple things. Probably for me, the biggest one is don't be afraid to ask questions and to explore something that you aren't uh, familiar with. I would also say too, is don't be afraid to ask for resources. I think right now, one of the things that is so important in the AI and ML industry is staying educationally relevant. And so making sure that your team is still up to snuff and making sure they still have all the qualified credentials and certifications, I think the longer that you don't maintain that kind of educational relevancy, the more you go behind the times and you can't catch up. And then it's a longer catch up game, of course, as you know. And so um, keeping that up to date is super important. Right now, I think we're spending a lot of time, you know, with tech debt and trying to develop new models, but maintain the previous models. So I think moving forward, I think it's one of those things where we're pretty good about having time to research each day. And I think that's some of the best part of our day because you can, you know, work on a certification or, or you can also um, find papers, right? And figure out what packages and models are the best thing to be moving towards. I think a really good example was a couple of years ago, we were building some forecasting tools. And um, this also comes back to the ethics piece, which is interesting, but we had been using ARIMA for a long time, right? That's something we can statistically explain. It's pretty well loved, right? And also it's, well done, right? There's a lot of evidence that that has worked. And so for our forecasting internally, it, it was performing fine. Um, but then we were doing some research and we found, I believe it's Meta's um, black box model called Profit. And so we applied that and oh my gosh, it, it picked Arima under the water. And it's funny because we usually do champion challenger competitions when we first choose our model. And just for the sake of relevancy, right? I think um, also making sure the packages, the packages and the models that we use are still usable, relevant, and there's nothing better is important. And so we were checking in on this model being like, hey, is this still the best of the best? And no, it wasn't. So then we started using profit and it performed way better. It's really cool to see um, also the breakdowns you can get as opposed to, I would say Arima performed best in our case, not always, but um, on more of like a monthly and, and a yearly standpoint, but you can really get down to a granular daily level um, at the profit model, which has been fantastic. But I will say, this begged a really good question, right? Um, I just went to the International Claims Association um, conference in Dallas and we and I spoke on fraud in the AI space, but one of the things that I got asked a lot and was talking about from some of the prosecutors was, you know, how do you deal with black box models in court? Because you can't explain it. And technically the people who made it usually can't explain it. So that's becoming less and less of an excuse for making bad decisions and adjudication. And that's very fair. So um, we came up with this Arima versus profit thing a couple of years ago. And so our legal team, we, you know, we're still working on what will that look in the future because there's kind of a caveat. Yes, we could choose to pick the ones that we can statistically explain. That makes sense, especially in court. We have an argument as opposed to just like, oh, I don't know. But at the same time, if there's these other models that are performing increasingly better and that's the way of the future, how does that look? So right now, one of the things that we're doing is we're maintaining just black box models for internal stuff that isn't customer facing, that isn't affecting any customer's life. But um, so we can still play with them and experiment with them. But right now we can't use black box models for any sort of customer facing or customer interacting product uh, or anything that was like adjudicating, right? Uh, impact a customer's experience. So that's something that we're keeping our eyes on, certainly, especially from a compliance standpoint, um, because the states are different. But right now, um, I think that'll be interesting to see how it changes. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. Yeah, absolutely. And I, okay, and, and love that those lessons. Uh, it, it's fascinating. A, so A, I love that they the standard gives you research time. I mean, just, mm -hmm. you're so right. I mean, it, it, tech evolves so quickly, as we know, um, you know, and especially in the AI space right now, everything is changing daily. So that is just amazing that that you're getting time to keep up and keep yourself educated and that your uh, company is putting such a high priority on that. Because because like you say, I mean, it's only benefiting the company. It's only been right. <laughs> standard to have you on top of your game, right? You know, um, oh, so important. And uh and I love that. And I love that you're using uh, this. So that's a very great example of using all the, your degrees, like these, this, this amazing combination of, of computer science, legal and psychology. That's just 
Very, Absolutely. Very, and I yeah. think, you know, that's one of the things that people don't think about from a candidate perspective is, you know, we have so many people come in with like just a data science background or just a IT background. And it's like, that's fine. But I will say that doesn't make them as unique. And sometimes that is actually what has them underperform because we need somebody with area expertise or can think differently in an area that we're not familiar with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So tell me, um, what is your definition of data? <laughs> Great question. I think it's information that can be used to make um, predictions or decisions about real world actual things. Ah, very, very, very short, sweet, to the point. Love it. And so tell me, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why, especially in, as you're working with AI, so many are worried that, you know, their jobs will go away for, um, and be replaced by, by AI. Yeah, great question. I think uh, both, but for the most part, I think it will be increasing explicitly in the need for data management. And I, I think it'll be increasing by a lot. You know, one of our statements when it comes to AI and application at work right now is we want to get rid of the fluff, the job that uh, the piece of the job that's monotonous, it's taking up your time, that you could be better using that time to be, you know, being creative or doing the harder work, right? Instead of working overtime, what if we could focus on consolidating the core hours to actually important stuff? And then maybe we could spend some time on education or maybe we could spend some time on, uh, you know, bigger picture goals and stuff. So we're advancing your career in a different direction. I think one of the things that I like about this company too, is we're pretty good at um, what we call short-term assignments or apprenticeships. And so that's where we allow, I know other companies do this too, but you know, 15 to 20% of somebody's time um, and they get to like basically job shadow for a couple months and a different department. And so by helping to use AI to automate as many pieces as, you know, of the unnecessary stuff that humans shouldn't be doing because that's a waste of everybody's time. Um, so they can start exploring other avenues too. I think that only makes the company stronger, especially because then they get expertise in different areas. Um, so in addition to that, for the data management piece, <laughs> one of the big pieces that we're gonna need for hiring in the near future here is compliance. I think that that's something that's under talked about right now. And this was also a big piece of conversation in uh, some other networking events I went to recently, because one of the things that comes to mind, of course, is right now for model maintenance, we have all of the states treated equally. Well, a lot of these states are enacting these legislations that say, well, you can't include our states, or you can't include these pieces, or you can't include these types of columns, right? Uh, or pieces of information. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> that has a lot of implications. And also, it's not like we can just turn off a state. Absolutely. that. And also, I would say these states that are enacting it have similar characteristics. So now we're biasing the models to avoid those kind of people in states. That's a huge demographic. So just by eliminating them for you know, safety reasons, which can understand why they're uh, impacting that legislation, like that's hugely impacting our models. So I think it's really important to note that keeping up to date on the compliance piece, and that's like such a like niche uh, occupation, right? How can we have somebody translate the compliance legalese into model performance and application? And right now that's a sore spot. This is something we're working on. We have one really amazing expert, but we need to grow that team. And, um, also, that's like a full-time job, just keeping up with some of the states, let alone all of the states. Right? Absolutely. So um, I think monitoring that kind of stuff is going to be huge moving forward, especially when we do have to start picking pieces away. How does that look? And how do we make sure the model doesn't change because of that? Yeah, yeah. I keep hoping for some sort of federal regulation so we don't have to keep track of 50 different... Right. I mean, much less, you know, having to keep track of global difference, you know, totally, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's so hard, <laughs> but uh, someday, someday we will get that. Someday. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what advice then would you give to people looking to get into a career in data management? Absolutely. Uh, keep exploring new things. I would say the biggest piece is back to that educational relevancy, right? Like don't um, think that you know everything already. Always assume you don't know everything. So trying new classes, certifications, even just talking to people, I think is the biggest piece that you can do. Also, don't be afraid to try another area if your company allows it um, or, or, you know, trying a new job. But I think for me, my biggest thing has been the connections within the company of 
they don't have necessarily like the SMEs, a tech background, but just having a dialogue with them and being able to make some amazing products because they have a problem statement uh, is really phenomenal. So just be as social as possible, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great advice. You know, we we get that uh, a, a lot um, in terms of questions, you know, and we get a lot of advice of, you know, of listen to the business and you need to interact right. with business. You can't be, you oh, know. Oh, gosh, yeah in the bat cave anymore and you know <laughs> it's isolated and <laughs> but um and, and you know did it help you to start you know more on the business side and you kind of mentioned that already um and grow and, and you you are very good at communicating not many people will um uh spell out the acronyms you know people well, will talk to you know will automatically say you know NLP but you it automatically define that what that was um so you know it, how is it helpful when you're talking it's starting out in the business to be able to to talk to people who uh aren't data scientists and help to bridge that gap to meet the business needs I certainly think it can be and also thanks for that I uh we have so many acronyms just in general that it feels like I constantly have to be a glossary <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah for me at least I think it was the correct decision um and I will say that that kind of makes you a unicorn in the sense of right if moving from the business to the tech side not everybody does that and so still being able to translate and keep those connections I think is really important I would say our other unicorn who's like the biggest data nerd ever he's so good um he's been around for 25 years and he started in the business too. He was an underwriter and then he did some sales stuff for a while and was the sales data guy. And so this company couldn't exist without him. He's just so brilliant. And I think that is because he also started in the business. So I will say that that was a huge advantage for both of us at least. And then not everybody needs to per se, but at least in our sake, that was really, really helpful. Oh, I love it. You know, I started uh, this podcast to show that there are, there's no linear, one linear path into right becoming a data practitioner, whether a data scientist, data modeler, or data architect. Um, and I think you're just such a shining example of that, especially with the, the very diverse um, package of degrees, uh, just really showing, you know, following your passions, you, you can find, you can merge and marry all of those into a, a job that uh, uses all those skills. That's just amazing. Oh, I couldn't agree more. For people that feel obligated to get certain degrees, because that's like what the, the business says, to, I would say, do what you want, do what you're passionate about, because then the right career path will find you. Uh, like with me and the fraud data scientist, I couldn't be happier because this is blending, right, all, all the things that I've wanted into the perfect little spot for me. And I will say, you know, this is something that's an interesting topic. And not a lot of people are building this in house. There's a lot of third party vendors. And there's a lot of so there's disconnect between those two things. And as, you know, talking with some of these lawyers about this, that's getting harder and harder to explain from a legal perspective. So people are starting to more move into in-house products. And I think now is the time, you know, one of the visions that we had when we first built up the data science department was kind of like a hub and spoke situation. So we'd have a core team that dealt with like the governance, the model management, the biases, stuff like that, uh, the tech debt. But we would then have these spokes that were like claim centric, underwriting, sales, fraud, right? And I think that that's what makes this secret sauce work so well. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. That's, that's really, I, it's so impressive. Really impressive. <laughs> oh, well, Alyssa, you know, I would be remiss. So if, if somebody wanted to learn more about the standard, where would they go? Yeah, uh, just our, our normal standard website. I think it's just the standard.com. Um, I can confirm and send you the link. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're always hiring. I can tell you that. Oh, I love it. Uh, and thank you so much for, for chatting with us today. It has been such a pleasure. Again, I just love you. Just such a shining example of, of I'm just going to say it again, of following your passion and mirroring all those. I think it's just a unique opportunity in, da in the data space, especially for those who have a passion in data that you can just marry all of your passions into one uh, job. Thank so you so much. I feel very lucky and super thrilled of where this has evolved into. Oh, no doubt. Oh, well, thank you. And again, for all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcast and in the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. 
Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank you.